Hey guys, how we doing out there? It's Andy. Hope you're kicking ass. Hope this week you're just gonna skull fuck this week. I have a feeling you guys are just gonna fucking kill this week. Um, no voicemails this week. I actually wanted to um, play a song off my new album that because this is the first of three episodes of the Bonnaroo Music Festival installment. Yes. We made it, we're playing on Bonnaroo, and uh, they were nice enough to let us be the podcast for um, for the music festival. So this week we have uh, King Gizzard, Stu, he's fucking awesome, you're gonna love this interview. But first, I wanted to play this song, it's called Dream. We, uh, we wrote this when we found out we got the Bonnaroo offer. <laughs> it was such an amazing feeling to play one of the most prestigious uh, music festivals and we wrote this song about it it's called dream so chris play the flutes baby um a world premiere on the world saving podcast well kind of you might have already listened to if you listen to the album but please enjoy our song from andy frasco in the un called dream Well, I thought I'd be in Inglewood Shooting threes with 24 Since I was a kid Always tried to score With that supermodel down the street The debutantes in Tennessee Mama always said That a dream is gonna dream Dream, dream, dream All you gotta do is dream All you gotta do is dream Well, I miss my shot with Kobe Bean To L.A. for Tennessee And that supermodel down the street Never noticed me But that brought me here onto the stage Rock and roll in purple haze Everybody here Just have a good time Dream, dream, dream Shoreline and Bonnaroo, Red Rocks and Hangout too. Things are good and I can't complain. Every day's a dream. Dream, dream, dream. All you gotta do is dream. Tie tie. Oh my god. You're and tired for a good reason for once. And we're back. Andy Frasco's World Saving <laughs> Podcast. You sound like shit. I'm Andy Frasco. I literally just got off my plane from summer camp. I'm Nick. I'm well rested because I didn't work at all this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my voice. Oh man. It's the hardest part about these two AM sets and festivals is the six AM fl- flight. Yeah, because 6 a.m. flight requires you to get to the airport at 4.30 or 5. Oh, my God. Yeah. Both airport adventures were close calls. At least your Peoria is like a small airport, so you don't have to, like, run through a bunch of security. I know, but you got to, like, we were in Virginia. We had to drive an hour to the airport. Oh, my God. I hate that. 
and everyone's all fucked up. And there should be a law for festivals. It has to be within 45 minutes of a major airport from now on. <laughs> yeah. None of this three-hour drive and then, you know. Woo! Hell yeah. What a fucking night. Ooh, ooh, Summer ooh. camp was amazing. I had a blast. How long were so you So was here? Rooster Walk. Um, eight hours. Oh, that's, that's enough. <laughs> it's a funny. Eight yeah. hours of Frasco is like two days of someone else. <laughs> Who'd you see? Um, I watched. Did you see Bayless? He probably I watched Main Squeeze. They're fun. They're like the best band, I think. I love that band. <laughs> They're a good band. I like them. Um, who was the best? We sat in with Little Feet. No, oh, they're cool, yeah. Um, Dolov Cohen was a great sit in. He was there? <laughs> Dolov showed up. He went to summer camp? Like a bat out of hell, dude. That's the only way he shows up. With his sister and uh, a. His yeah, MAGA sister? No, no, the other one. He has a MAGA sister, right? He's got a MAGA sister. Like insane MAGA sister. Yeah, like is, conspiracy yeah, yeah. theories, MAGA. That sounds... I wish I had a sibling like that. <laughs> so bad. That'd be so fun. All it my siblings nice. are like very normal and like... Rational. Man, summer camp. It was fun. But this isn't about summer camp. This is the Bonnaroo episode. Oh, yeah. We're on Bonnaroo now. <laughs> <laughs> we're like NASCAR. <laughs> I would love that. If someone, I will wear stuff all over my body. Just gotta pay me, obviously. But Bonnaroo is coming up, Manchester, guys. Tennessee. Um, we're playing Bonnaroo, and we have King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard there today. on the website. On the web, I can't even the, fucking talk. We're my, a podcast. This is useless. This is no people like this. This is this is Andy. This is the Monday they don't see after my Monday morning motivations. <laughs> Which are recorded on... You missed your Monday motivation last week. I know. People were pissed about it. I know, but like... The internet was up in arms <laughs> about what, you what not am I gonna posting. Do? Follow your dreams. Exactly. I'm on a yacht. That's exactly what I was going to say. I was like... It's like so obnoxious if I'm like telling yeah. every... I'm like... Then I'm like a real one of those basic bitch influencers. Some welder know? getting ready to go <laughs> yeah. weld for 12 hours. <laughs> yeah. And I'm and on like, a yacht saying, you could do it. Yeah. Keep working yeah. hard. I got to go. My jet ski's done <laughs> guessing up. <laughs> Keep working hard, and you can take three vacations in two weeks. <laughs> You've been on vacation six I know, I'm family. done. I'm no done. more vacations. No more. No, this is it. Only work. Only work. Oh, Just chill. You live in Denver. People come here on vacation. And the problem is I. it's summertime, and everyone booked my house five months ago. Oh, yeah, true. Summer. Summer, summer, summer time. I can't even talk. I can't kick back and unwind because my house is rented out again because it's too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't wrong. Denver, baby. It's beautiful, but a one bedroom is going to cost wow. you about three. You're spicing it up tonight, and I like it. I haven't seen you since my birthday. I know. I had a great birthday. First, I played a show and almost. <laughs> what a segment. First, what a turnover. Well, I want to get this in. First. Because I know we're not going to go very long today because Tandy's tie-tie. First, I played a show that tanked because it was 30 degrees in May on my birthday. Oh, your birthday show tanked? It wasn't like, it was, you know, there was, I guess Ophelia's had worse shows that week, but, you oh, know, but. Yeah, it, was, it was, it's all right. It was 30 degrees outside. Then on the way home, my, my lift got blasted at a red light or at a green light. That was at your left. birthday party? On the way home from my birthday show that didn't do well. Luckily, we had it. It was a guaranteed free show, so whatever. Hold on, hold on, hold on, backtrack. Yeah. What a shitty birthday. You didn't birthday. put that together? No. <laughs> you got in the accident on your birthday? It's such a Nick Gerlach birthday. <laughs> it's like so perfect. I don't know why I'm laughing. But it's, it's funny as shit. <laughs> Tragedy is funny. I mean, I didn't get hurt too what bad. A shitty birthday. <laughs> such a shit birthday. <laughs> No one should feel bad for me. <laughs> Laugh at me. Laugh. I'm sorry you got an accident, no, that's but cool. that's fucked up. No one showed up to the gig. and I mean, people showed up. I just wanted it to be like a slamming <laughs> birthday show. You know what I mean? It was fun. People uh, came out. Nikki, like, I'm sorry, buddy. I was I was predicting like a slammer, you know? Yeah. Based on the internet buzz, it was good. None of those people came out. <laughs> no, not like I like a bunch of people were sharing it and like posting it and be like, yeah, blah, blah, good luck. And then none of them came. In their defense, it was 30 degrees on May 20th. That's insane. I heard it snowed pretty bad. It snowed. I mean, pretty bad for May. Yeah. In January, it would have been fun. So that was my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> this is like such my life. I'm though. sorry, bro. It's all right. It happens. My band also had to break up because we had to change our name because Bill Cosby raped someone. You know what I mean? So it's God. like. Well, at least you have this podcast named after me. <laughs> yeah. At least I'm the other guy in a podcast. <laughs> 
I get free gummies twice a month. Uh, speaking about that, did you take any dialing gummies oh, to yeah. help your back? Yep. My back's messed up, my hip and my neck and my shoulder. So what happened? Oh, we were turning left um, on Colfax. Were going, you drunk? Well, I was in the back seat of a lift, so it doesn't I matter know, if I was drunk. Were you drunk? I was probably like, like, you wouldn't have thought I was drunk, but I had a few pops. Did you, you know? um, did you um, wear a seatbelt? Yes, I always wear a seatbelt. Even in an Uber? <laughs> Why do people... This Okay, guys, listen... <laughs> PSA, Ubers are cars. They're, it's they're the same thing. It's the world. You're still in the world. You're like the 10th person to say, oh, that's crazy. I never wear my seatbelt in a lift. Why? Even if you feel safer with the professional driver, it wasn't my driver's fault. I don't think. I don't know. I wasn't looking at the light, but I don't think she ran the light. I think the other guy did. So you got to make some money? I don't know. I can't talk about the ongoing lawsuit on a podcast. <laughs> anyway, she was they turning left. You yeah, that- but I don't want to. You know, who knows, man? I'm also being censored by the federal government right now. It's like... Why? Because I made... <laughs> Did you see that flashlight post I made the other day on no. Instagram? It was like a slushy. It was like a fake slushy machine, like this thing, and you squeeze it, and it yeah. looks exactly like a flashlight. Yeah. So I made like a post like, oh, my God. You know what I mean? Like, And Instagram deleted it. I'm being censored by the federal government, Andy. You're not censored on this podcast. Hell, man. yeah. Keep talking, bud. That's all. I, mean, I know. I, f- I feel like I got to do the heavy lifting this week. And then I went to Red Rocks t- um, twice this weekend while you were at, ba- at festivals. Yeah, I tried to come and meet up with you for the String Duster show. Yeah, you didn't make it. No, it seemed like an ordeal. It's such a journey, but it's worth it. Red Rocks is such a journey. I kind of like that about it, though. I was thinking about that this week, and I was like, you got to, because it is a special place to see a show. It's different than anywhere else. Right? Yeah, you, you, you definitely earn it. You earn it. You or you get an that. Uber up the hill if you're tired. <laughs> Ten bucks. I didn't. I walked one of them, even with my hurt body. Yeah. And then I went to Motet and Pigeons the second night, and the power went out during Pigeons. <laughs> the power went out. Dude, I've never seen this before in my life. I've barely seen this in venues. I guess it went Where'd out. Where'd the power go out on? Pigeons. Oh, during no. their set. It was cool. They handled it really awesome. I have, What'd they do? I have two videos if you want to watch them. Yeah, I'll watch them. All right. So I guess they lost power in all of Morrison. Scott Morrill said that this has happened earlier this season, too. So it's not the venue's fault or anything, I don't think. No. Like, no one, like, fucked up and, like, tripped over something. Like, there was a huge power issue. Wow. Anyway, so they were, like, in the chorus of some big, I don't know their songs, but everybody was singing it. So it must be one that everyone knows, you know? They were, like, in the middle of the chorus, and all of a sudden, both the, you know, the video walls, they all went out. Everything went out at once. It was so jarring. And then it was out, like, way awkwardly too long. Pull up the drum video. And then Gator, hot guy Gator, kept... Save the day. He oh, just, speaking of that. Because the only thing you can hear is drums. You know who's getting jealous? Who? That we're calling everyone hot besides him. And I had a conversation about stay it. Stay sick. I just got to stay, stay sick. sick. I knew it was stay sick. Oh, my God. He I'm taking me. it off the stand. Oh, <laughs> Ryan, stay sick. <laughs> Ryan fucking stay sick. My boy. We were just, he was, he hung out. We hung, I hung out with him a lot. Uh, Bayless went home. He always goes home the second they hit their last note on yeah. Sunday. Yeah. I it's like, da da <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Stasic was like Don't sugarcoat I'm like You look really cute today Ryan Your hair is blonde he's jealous isn't he Yeah I'm like you look cute And he's like Don't tell me that Don't fucking butter me up I know who you think is hot <laughs> He does We But does he think that when we say other people are hot, we're not saying he's not hot. There's no limit. There's no ceiling here. There's no ceiling in hotness. A lot of people could be hot. All hot guys matter, huh? Stay sick, you know? <laughs> Stay sick, you're still hot. You're hot. Let's have a PSA. God. Ryan? One guy being hot doesn't mean you're not hot. Ryan Stasek, you are still hot. <laughs> All these younger musicians who are getting you know strong and muscular like Gator. I hung out with Gator. He's hot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was with you, remember? Yeah. We were ragging on that thing I don't want to talk about in the podcast. It's, what, what, I can't talk what about were we it. ragging on? It's too mean. Okay. Don't say it then. I will after. But I can't remember. It was a certain list of things. Of? That people... Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, Roger, yeah Roger, Roger, I can't Roger. do that. No, can't do no, no. that. That was at Cervantes. It was funny as hell, though. It was pretty Just funny. Just verify for the fans that that was, was being funny. funny. I'll clap up, too. All right. The inside joke. Over. <laughs> I love doing that. All right, Gator. Hot. And that was when Gator was hot. And, um, oh, yeah, we did hang out. We hung out with all those EDM kids. Yeah, Menard's show. Yeah, Menard's show. And I got yelled at from some girl. She's like, you're not a DJ. I'm like. I can still attend I can events. still take a photo with these motherfuckers. Oh, God. People are so fucking. You're still an annoying. artist. They invited you. Yeah. 
Like, you don't, you shouldn't take a picture with these DJs. You're not a DJ. I'm like, how about I take a picture with some cool guys I'm yeah, friends with? Yeah, how about with? I take a picture with my friend, Michael? She, she's just mad because she's not in the picture. She had to take the photo. Me and Michael want to do a Ghost Stories podcast. Really? Yeah. He was supposed to show up today. I know. I didn't. T- it, it was too random. We'll do another time with okay. him when you're not, like, on no sleep. Mm-hmm. So you saw Gator. He's hot. Stay I sick, saw Gator. Jealous. Stay sick. Um, I, the best thing I realized that our fan, not our fans, are like our group of bands that we all hang out with. Uh-huh. Everyone had each other's backs. Everyone was at each other's shows. All the homies That's were cool. at the show. All that we were all at their shows. Yeah, you do that sometimes for people at festivals. Not me last year at summer camp, but you know, other people. A couple bands didn't show up when we supported them. You should have done the Olympic parade with them all. You didn't. Well, do I did. I had fucking 25 sit-ins. <laughs> oh, God. Same shit. Just like we talked about. But these are cool sit-ins. It doesn't matter. They're still sit-ins. De Brian. I felt like I was in control. It wasn't all night, right? Yeah, no. All the, all the sit-ins were like... Perfect. But they were still a lot of sit-ins. You're gonna... Brian's not gonna like this. Well, too fucking bad. Yeah. Um, we had great sit-ins. We had Cherub sit-in. One. Two guys or both of them? Uh, just Jason. Just Jason. He sang with me on Talking okay. Heads. That's one. We had the whole band of La Special. That's four. We had uh, Low Down Brass Band. Another five, right? Nine. We had Mike Dillon. Ten. <laughs> this is one <laughs> set, guys. We had... Um, who else did we have? Oh, Sack Squatch. That's 11. Um, and then... Who else? You might get twelve. I might do two for him because he's in costume. Oh, little strangers. Tw- How many of them? Two. That's thirteen. <laughs> I'm only gonna do one for Sasquatch. Get- <laughs> you want thirteen guys? There's there only was- five people in your fucking band, dude. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't all at once. Well, who else? Yes, it was. What? That was it. Rooster. What about Rooster Walk? There's a lot of people too. <laughs> Rose- <laughs> yeah, I forgot. There's a whole other <laughs> festival. <laughs> Roosevelt, we had Roosevelt Collier. Oh, sick. He's he doesn't count. I'm not going to count him, actually. He's too good. He's sick. And then I had... Um, <laughs> I am going to count him, though. One. Two fiddle players. Two of the people playing the same instrument. You heard it here first. <laughs> Separately. Okay, but still. Three. Um, we had Taz, my son. Four, your son, Taz. I hope his um, dad watches this. So he was four. there. Oh. I'm like, this is my son. He's going to wear condoms. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was like... I'm like a pumping him up like I was a proud. I'm like this motherfucker's going to Yale. Well, He's been at you, Yale for a whole yeah. year. I know, but <laughs> I was just jacking him You're up. Like, this dude. guy. He's like, I have been at Yale for a year, Andy. I'm smarter than you. I love it. He's like <laughs> growing up in front of my eyes, and it's amazing. It makes you want to have a kid of your own. I bet. Nope. So that's uh, four at Rooster Walk. Only a one hour set there. Uh, two hours. There's <laughs> other. There was more than that. Yeah. Who else said it? Uh, we Kendall. Oh, five. Kendall. On the drums, yeah. And I guess that was it. We didn't really have that many. That's that's 18 in two days. <laughs> so let's like, we're going to start an Andy Frasco sitting counter this summer, okay, for all your festivals. That I think you're going to go over 200 for the summer. What, 200 sit-ins? Oh, yeah, and that's by, what, through September probably, right? <laughs> Unless you have some weird October festival. I'm in more in control. Last it doesn't matter. Years, they still happened. I know. I, I basically do, like... One fourth the set sit ins, and then we, we play the rest by ourselves. I understand that. Bride guy's not going to like this, though. I know. You're going to get an angry voicemail. He texts me, like, How was it? Why did we spend all this time making this album, <laughs> recording all these songs? This isn't how he really talks, guys. I do this anytime I'm making fun of someone, I do this voice. Making um, all these songs, and then you don't even play them at your festival, and you have a dog he said, and pony text, show. Don't forget to talk about your new LP shows yeah. and podcasts. Well, that's true. Your sets this summer. I know you're on it. Just reiterate. I'm surprised he wants you to talk about the podcast. Actually, <laughs> yeah. Well, podcast is making every. Is, I have a theory that he hates secretly hates the podcast. Why? Because it I'm wasn't his idea. Yes, that's how managers are. <laughs> He told me not to do the podcast. He's like, See? "Why? Why are we wasting our time on this podcast?" Well, now they're the only thing that, that makes any money in the entire <laughs> entertainment industry. <laughs> Every rich person in entertainment now is because of their podcast. I mm. feel like. <laughs> so yes, we did have eighteen sit-ins. Hell yeah! But still, bracket up eighteen sit-ins, Frasco. Um, Remember you know, that that's eighteen entertainers. That's eighteen different ways to sign up for Repsy.com. Oh, they're still in. They're still here. They Hi, Repsy. Actually, Repsy signed up for another six months. Let's go. Thanks, Repsy. Keeping the light bill on around Thank here. Thank you, bud. Maybe I could actually live in my house now. Mm. 
sponsor. Might need a third sponsor. <laughs> Might need a third sponsor. Sign up for Repsy.com if you're in a band. If um, Magician. Magician. What else you got? Comedian. My brain's not working. Comedian. DJ. Juggler. Uh, Wedding planner. Yeah. Independent Wedding venue. <laughs> Juggler. Oh, yeah. I forgot venues. I wonder if you could sign up as a chef and you're like an entertaining chef like Emeril Lagasse. Like Benny Bloom? Like, bah! <laughs> like Benny Blue. He has a cooking show. <laughs> yeah. Benny and the Cookers or whatever. I don't know. What's Remember when called? Benny came over the house? He's like, I have a cooking show. Yeah, but I wasn't here when you guys did that. And I was like, we busted our asses to do a, the <laughs> cooking show. And then the next day we went to one of my buddy's house. And he's, we were at, he's um, like, he basically fired us before we found yeah. out we were fired. We were at Paris's doing Paris's thing. Yeah, Paris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, he's like, oh, yeah, Benny's doing a cooking show. here. I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck? Like, I don't have enough time for this shit. Yeah. So shout out to Benny Bloom. Shout out to Benny Just Bloom. <laughs> for making, making your decision. Hey, he's a hustler. Quick. I'm a hustler, mad. baby. So sign up for Repsy.com and uh, get your band out there. It's literally <laughs> free until they book you something. I've seen their Insta story, and they've been getting bands a lot of fucking Frat. cool college shows. Maybe I need to sign up. You should. You think they got Gerlock money on that website? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so. I've seen what you get paid. <laughs> I've seen what you get paid. I think they definitely have that kind of money, actually. I think under no circumstances does anyone not have that money. Um, and then let's um, let's just do the dialed in one, too. Dialed in gummies. We don't have any right here. Where are they? I know. I ate them all. You did? I have some more downstairs. I just brought Really? Them. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I brought the new Sam's. I love them. I've been fine. Those are finally letting me sleep on airplanes. Oh, really? They help you sleep on an airplane? Oh, my God. I'll take one. And pass the fuck out. One, yeah. I take three every night. Yeah. It's fun. Ooh. I take one, play some video games, and then I take two more, and I go nine-nine. Is it illegal to um, yes. bring weed on planes? Uh, Yeah. Really? 100%. Oh. Yeah. Maybe I shouldn't promote that. Under no circumstances should you. Well, no, you ate it before you got on the plane, so it doesn't matter. You didn't have it on the I plane. I ate it. I ate it before you got on the plane. a coffee. Yeah, that's legal. Waiting for the airplane. Yeah, that's fine. I smuggled it into. Oh no, my airport. god! Don't say the word smuggled. Can we bleep out the word smuggled? <laughs> we can't. Let's try not to admit to federal uh, crimes. Br- Literally, I have no filter, so you could ask me anything and I'll say it. Man, I wish I cared about you enough to <laughs> <laughs> about your stupid fucking personal life, but I just don't. Oh man, I barely care about my personal life anymore. Oh, okay, <laughs> we're done. We're done. Okay, I can't, this is why we're. This is why we shouldn't have done this podcast. Uh, no, I right like it. After a, forty-eight hours of not one. sleeping, that's a good one. We talked about a lot of fun shit. Beep, 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 <laughs> back, beep, beep. Back, that, back that, back that, back up, back it up, back it up, back it up, back it up. <laughs> I think about this if I'm just gonna be alone for the rest of my life. Oh, you always have the kakuzas. I love. <laughs> I have you too. <laughs> The level <laughs> You don't have me like you have the cuckoos or don't love. That's true. I could fade into the mist at any moment. Yeah. <laughs> Just go back to Indiana. I love when I ask you start to start digging go. graves. <laughs> you love what? I love when I ask to, if you want to hang out. Sometimes you just text no. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> so great. Hey, you want to go to this? No, yeah. I don't. Isn't that kind of refreshing? It is. Wouldn't you rather hear that than like, oh, I got this. Mm, I have to go over here and do like you can tell they're lying, making up some dumb excuse. Just be like, no, I want to watch a TV. Well, that was. Oh, man. She didn't get mad. She got sad that I didn't talk to her for two years. Well, she just needs to realize that it has nothing to do with her. Yeah. That you're an alcoholic and you just need to be alone to sober up. (laughs) And not be hung over anymore. And sometimes it's better if you're not around people because you're all hung over. And you're going to be a passive aggressive dick. So you might as well just get some lunch by yourself. <laughs> all right, guys. Enjoy. <laughs> I'm on a podcast. Stu. Wow. <laughs> I almost died on my birthday. Right, there's nothing like a. Uh, How was your out birthday? With... Oh, no one came. And then I got blasted in a car accident. <laughs> How was yours? And then the cops made me walk home from the car accident. <laughs> The cops made you the walk cops home? did such a terrible job, like checking out my act. They're like, should sue them too. I'm gonna sue everybody. I'm suing the city of Denver. I'm gonna sue Ophelia. First, we're going for Uber, then, we're going to Denver, and then we're going to the <laughs> LAPD. <laughs> Nick retired. Woo! Nick retired. He made $18,000 on a car crash and he retired. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Next up on the interview hour, we have Stu McKenzie from King Gizzard and Lizard Wizard. Yes. This band is popping off. This guy is a fucking genius. 
This guy's put out like 20 plus records in the last five years. This band is very, um, they just do what the fuck they want, and I love that. Those guys, Stu was on vacation, and he was nice enough to uh, to uh, do this interview while he was having his only two days off because he's going to be on tour forever, like us, um, for the next couple months. So keep kicking ass out there, Stu. And um, he's playing Bonnery, so this is going to be the first installment, baby. Yes. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome us. To the interview hour, Stu McKenzie from King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. Let's do this. Stu! What up? How's it going over there? What are you eating? Eating corn chips and guacamole because I'm in Mexico. <laughs> That's what you do. <laughs> treat, treat yourself, bud. Well, let's talk a little bit about it. You're, you're, were, you got, were you born in Melbourne or was the band formed in Melbourne? Um, so... We're all Australian, but we're all kind of from ar- around different parts. Um, I would say, like, as a general backstory, um, everyone knew each other before the band. Some people for longer time periods. I've known Cookie and Ambrose since we were teenagers, um, and Lucas since we were teenagers, actually, as well. Um, and then um, Cavs and our old drummer, Eric, they went to school together. Um, they're from a completely different part of town. Uh, I grew up at, like on the coast in like a surfy kind of town. Lucas was from Geelong, which is like the main satellite city of Melbourne, I guess. None of us are from Melbourne, I guess, is where, where I'm getting <laughs> with, with all this. We're all kind of like, we're all kind of country kids, really. Um, and then we met in Melbourne, like living there and becoming fr- like, you know, mutual friends. And we're all playing different bands. And at the start, King Gears was like, the fun band it was like the the band that like it was kind of jammy and loose and like we didn't really practice um we just would and it was the 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 membership was fluid like people would come along and just play one show or um we tried to make a band where like you could play if you didn't even know the songs or you didn't even know any of the members you would be able to join and like play a show and that's kind of like the early version of gizzard was that um, but yeah, the, the seven that stuck around for like a long time before Eric left the band or whatever, we're, the, we're just the seven people who, I don't know, like just thought that concept like had validity, maybe yeah. everyone else was like, I'm out of here. This was, this is stupid. Um, so yeah, in that sense, it was never really like a put together band. That's kind of why we got the sort of like two drummers, three guitarists, like harmonica, this weird instrumentation makes no sense. We play like weird genres and shit. It just, it just happened, you know, it just like yeah. spontaneously formed, um, which, which I like. And it's always felt like a nice fluid energy of Gizzard. What, um, what do you like about the open door policy? Um, I mean, for starters, it's not like, it's not quite like that anymore, but in those days, I guess, it was a side project for lack of a better word. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like a very meticulously crafted idea. Actually, it was like, well, we're all kind of doing hits gigs with these other bands that just feel a little bit more serious. And we're all like trying to do like annoying crap. Like we played on the radio and like, we're trying to like get gigs at festivals and like do shit that like normal people do. Right. Let's have a band where, we just try to like alienate the audience on purpose and just have fun on stage, you know? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in that sense, it was like, well, yeah, like your mate Jimmy wants to join tonight. Cool. Like bring him along. Does he, does he know how to play an instrument? No. All right. No problem. Like just, you know, <laughs> it was kind of, it was kind of that. Yeah, and it kind of it's like a lesson of like not taking life so seriously. The minute you know, like you said, of all these other bands you're taking so seriously, and the band that you didn't take so seriously is the thing that's fucking popping off. It is weird how it kind of happened like that. I I do I do think that there was a magical chemistry between like the band members, and that again like wasn't formulated but maybe it was why after the open door policy had sort of just naturally settled like the dust had settled and there was just seven people left maybe there's something about that which kind of creates like an interesting 
chemistry between the people that are left. It's like, okay, I get it, I get it, I get it. All the people who didn't really like, you know, vibe with the with the flow or the concept or whatever bailed. Um, and I think that there's something to be said maybe for that about like forming a band in that way and just letting it be, just letting it be until it just be settled. I don't know. I, I would never do it again, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it worked in that, it, it worked in that instance. Yeah, I bet it did. I mean, I want to talk about the, the writing process. Like you guys putting out 20 records. What the fuck? Are you ADD or like what? <laughs> give me, give me the synopsis of when, when you're in the process of making a record and deciding to make another one, or do you make all of them at the same time? Give, give me, give me a little bit inside scoop on, on what's going on there. I say it's usually there's there's always an overlap, um, and I'd say there's there's usually like two, three concurrent projects. Sometimes there's more and you don't even know that a project is a project yet. Like sometimes you've got three songs that you think are on the same album and they end up being three different albums, you know? Yeah. Um, and it still, it still takes us two years to make a record generally, like from start to finish. I feel like that's pretty, pretty standard. I, there's, there's, there's something about that length of time to let like an idea or that many ideas or 40, 50 minutes of music kind of gestate into like, a finished thing that just it's just the time it takes you know right i just think we've, we've usually just got a few projects on the go um i think yeah i don't know why we do this but we do it it for, for me personally it's actually my favorite part i love playing shows i love touring i've actually grown to love it more especially the live performance i think over the years i've i enjoy that more than i ever have now but the recording and like the writing has always and, and probably will always be my favorite part. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I like, I love writing songs because I know that I'll get to record them, you know, and so much of the time it's like I write a song around an idea that I want to experiment with in the studio or like an idea I want to experiment with like a, with like a, with like a chord progression or like a, certain set of instrumentation I've never done before or whatever. It's like the writing is the recording with, with gears. Um, that's kind of, I don't know, maybe that's why we make lots of stuff. Cause it's like in my mind, the funnest bit. Yeah. And also do you write a lot to kind of like, you talk a lot about anxiety in your past interviews. I'd like to, you know, talk about that a little more. Do you think writing helps, you know, you navigate your anxiety? I think it's like something I feel like I'm in control of, which I think is kind of powerful. And I think the primary thing about what you're talking about is that it's like when you can build something from the ground up, from literally nothing, from the spark of an idea to create something that is tangible and like be in control of that, there's nothing to me personally more just like rewarding and yeah, like soothing and just validating that, like I've, you know, that that you can do. Um, so I think I think that's 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 definitely a driver for sure. I also am not too good at chilling or like sitting still. Yeah. So so it's just felt like keep being the shark. You just keep swimming, and yeah, it's just like my version of like feeling good. It's just kind of like being really busy. Have you ever, did you ever get into any substance abuse growing up? I don't think I'd use the word abuse. I would like use the word like experimentation. And I like, I'm a kid and like a family and stuff now. So I'm pretty chill. Um, yeah, I'd say there was like, you know, with everyone. I mean, everyone in our generation, everyone that we like grew up with, everyone that we know, like it's kind of just given at this stage really um i'm i'm pretty hesitant to like make links between creativity and like that type of stuff in, in like a public sphere because I, I kind of do think it's bullshit more, yeah. you know for the most part i think it's like an excuse that people have to like justify like partying or getting lit or whatever <laughs> which is fine 
Like whatever you got to do. What um, about psychedelics to cure your anxiety? Yeah, I think there's some validity in that actually, for sure. Um, I think there's a version of like doing it to like, uh, <laughs> like clear the page, like erase the page, you know, like right. go back to a blank slate. I think, I think that's real. Um, I think it's pretty, I think it's like pretty dangerous too, you know, so I will, I will always like say to take with a grain of salt because I have seen people go down like a, a dark path or one thing lead to another kind of type of path. And I do, I do truly honestly think that you don't need to do that in order to like clear the blank slate. I think it's like just, you know, how many people in the world are addicted to coffee? Like I'm addicted to coffee. Yeah. Like if I don't have coffee for a day, I have like the maddest um, headaches and like, I just think there's a version of sort of just like being at peace or in control of your mind that like you can do by yourself that I think is what you're talking about. Um, but yeah, like there's a million ways to try to like be in control of, of your brain. And sometimes those tools are really powerful. Yeah. And I agree with that. You know, it's like you talk about having your own destiny and having your own control. <laughs> what about what's the, what was the difference between touring earlier in the band when it was an open door versus touring now as you know a unit hmm. um honestly it's, in some ways it's exactly the same like i feel like the dynamic between the band members and like our friendship is is still like really amazing and really strong and like very brotherly which i'm very grateful for and i and i love that aspect and i feel like that actually hasn't changed a lot and in a lot of ways we're still just doing the same thing which is cool somewhat unsettling now that I say that out loud because I'm like in my 30s now um <laughs> but it's changed like in the sense that yeah we very very fortunately get to travel the world and play to lots of people and visit new places and see new things and do all these exciting adventures together and not have day jobs. Um, we have like amazing crew that travel with us who like really make things happen. Um, it's we're, yeah, we're really, we're really lucky that the show has changed infinitely and has changed. I would like to think it changes fairly significantly every few years, which I'd like to try to keep kind of doing. Um, I guess I haven't even talked musically, like musically that it's changed yeah infinitely like it, it yeah. really has and it's become kind of like it started off extremely loose it got really tight and now it's gotten extremely loose again but in a new way it's just gotten jammier um and yeah like longer and more improvised as we've learned to like play with each other better and listen to each other and um I don't know. I've kind of just been trying to vibe with the idea of every single show being a unique experience, mm -hmm. um, which is not a unique idea at all. But for us, it kind of is. It kind of is new to like the Gizzard sort of like canon or whatever. Over the last few years of shows, it sort of like progressed towards being more like that, which has made it feel um, so much more fulfilling as a musician and like a creative person like every day being on the road it's like every show feels like an adventure now which is great and i feel less like a um performer and more like a musician yeah which is kind of like what i always wanted how hard is it you seem like you're a man of structure how hard is it to like get your head how, do, how hard is it to get out of your own way to just have this loose life Life, like as in go on tour and stuff. Yeah, touring or just like trying to live life with no, um, I, don't, I wouldn't say obligations, but no um, expectations. Hmm. Um, the hardest part is just navigating like all the things that you have missed, being at home, your family and your friends and and stuff, and like seeing people doing fun shit, like that you're not there for. 
yeah. or even you know like having projects like a, a record that just doesn't get finished like because you're on the road and you can only work like an hour a day in this like small window when you're like I don't know, not asleep or like a sound check or whatever um, on a plane, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that's hard, but I actually do quite enjoy the, the chaos of touring and the every day is a different thing of touring and every day you wake up in a different city thing of touring, you know, that's always been like, I always felt like it's given me life. Yeah, and coming coming out of that adventure, yeah, you like feel tired and like you like sick and stuff and like all of those things. But I always feel quite creative when I get off the road and start writing and, and that sort of thing. I love how, it. How do you like separate dad time with your musician time? How do you delegate the time to do both? Mm, um, it is a hard one. On on. On some level, it feels like it's come easy because I actually love being a dad so much. And like, this is, I don't know if you can see this. This is, my, this is Minty. She's literally sitting oh, right yeah, here. I see it. I see oh, Hey, what's up? <laughs> Cute. <laughs> <laughs> hey, bye. What's up? I think she wants to get, I think she wants to get out of the high chair right now. Yeah. Um, it's good. Um, it's um, challenging in the sense of, balance and like expectations and stuff but it's just like so I actually don't think about that very often it's so rewarding and so fun and feels so right and like we felt so ready to do it after not being parents for like so long and yeah it's um I'm very lucky that like my wife Pip is just absolute super mum and I don't know what like I would do without her honestly we're we're a good we're a good team we're a good unit, um, but I have had I've had had to get I have had to get better at separating my time and like delegating my time and like when I get home, I try not to just like think about the song I'm writing anymore, which I find very challenging to do actually. But I think I've gotten a lot better at it. Um, just like when I'm a dad, I'm just like a dad, you know yeah. what I mean? And then like I have to be like, yo, I'm out. I'm like. I'm, I need to go to work, you know, whereas in the past it was like, I just was kind of always working or thinking about work or thinking about a song or thinking about something or like there, but not there, you know, and I, I didn't really have any boundaries or whatever with that. Like if I needed to get up from the dinner table and like record a voice memo, I probably would just do it. Whereas now I sort of, which is probably like actually more normal, like most people have jobs <laughs> like have to learn how to do this at a much the younger age yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> but like i'm having to learn how to do that now no so. I, I mean as long as you're trying that's you know, that's broad that's what i want to talk about like it, is it hard for you to stay present because you're thinking about all this other shit all the time um hard yes but like it's never felt like a problem do you know what i mean yeah it's just like okay i have to do this now it's like I don't know. Is it like a lot of things are hard, but you don't, they don't feel like a problem. I think it's like that. It's just, yeah. Being, being a parent is hard from time to time. Like I think everyone would say that, but it's, it's just so awesome that it's okay. Yeah. Did you, were you ever afraid to be a dad? Um, hmm. I think we talked about doing it for several years before we did it. And so it felt like by the time we actually had a kid and you also like, as everyone knows, you get nine months to like figure your shit out as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, which is pretty awesome. And a lot of time in my mind. Um, no, it felt, it felt really right. We also had Minty, our daughter Minty, um, around like in the pandemic and there was like nothing to do anyway so it was kind of like the perfect time in so many ways um i think the fear was there but like honestly i i do feel like i kind of felt ready um and i feel like i kind of just thought about it and prepared for it in my mind a lot and we we, we both had like Tip and I both thought about it 
a shitload before we did it. And like, yeah, while we were kind of like, well, Pip was pregnant and waiting for her to pop out and join, join the world. So yeah, I don't know, a version of fear for sure, but not like, oh shit. It was more like, <laughs> well, I'm going to be a parent. That's so weird. <laughs> What's like? What are your fears? Do you have any fears, Stu? Um, I have heaps of fears. My my main resounding fear is of mushrooms, which is really strange. And like being like a vegetarian person <laughs> is a really annoying thing to be like fearful of. But I, I have like a very I, I, I'm scared of mushrooms, which is like a running joke within fingers. Um. I, I just don't like mushrooms for some reason, like a lot. So, like all, all different kinds of mushrooms or hallucinogens, all of them. All, no, all of them, all of them. It's so funny. It's like if I if I if I asked you to like go and like pick up like a lump of clay and like eat it or like dirt some shit, like <laughs> that's how I feel about them. Oh, it's fucking amazing, man. Yeah, it's so funny what what we're scared of. What about flying? You scared of flying? You never been scared of flying? Um, um, not beyond like the normal fear of like it being just, I think it's flying generally slightly anxiety inducing. I, I wouldn't say I'm any different to anyone else. I feel like I fear being like old and vulnerable for some reason. Um, and I feel like I have like nightmares about that. Um, no, I, I wouldn't say, oh, I don't know. Am I? What else do I fear? I think about being old a lot and like, yeah, being vulnerable or like, I don't know, that for some reason, like, I feel like it is a part of a driver of me, like, working hard as a younger person, just feeling like when I want to actually, like, stop or retire or like, whatever, I'm not just going to be like starving <laughs> or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like, I'm still going to have, like, friends and family to, like, hang out with and, like, do shit with. Um, maybe I fear that. What about um, what about death? What's your take on death? Mm. Um, when I was a kid, I used to think about dying a lot. Or, like, maybe I went through a phase of, like, a couple of years of thinking about it a lot, which is really morbid. But I've... I've since learned that it's like quite normal and like people just don't talk about it. What, but, um, you, what were you scared I, I about definitely got like a, in the beginning? I just used to like, I just used to like sort of like play it out in my head, like how I was going to die and like when I was going to die and what would happen and what it would be like. And, you know, all of those things and like trying to come to, because I kind of grew up in an atheist household I never really ever was someone who even thought about the idea of the afterlife being real or anything like that. And trying to grapple with the concept of end, you know, the, the end of like all of this, yeah. I think is something I spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, I don't know if that guy constitutes a fear. It certainly was a fear then. I definitely still like have a fascination with death and I think it's, it's it I think it comes from being like anyone in like the field of arts there there there's a poetic aspect to death, and I think it's because it scares people so much it's like it's just a powerful writing tool, you know it's a powerful thing that like it elicits a visceral response from people or anything that does that right is kind of like handy in your arsenal of like being a writer but but I, i'd say i'm obsessed with death um maybe that's like the way i deal with the fear yeah and you know it's like when you think about it when you overthink about it kind of like you stop thinking about it in a, in a weird way like what about you know you talk about that open door you had in your band was there any um band members you wish was still in the band hmm. um there are some really good friends that used to play with us from time to time and it would be so cool if they were still in the band but you know honestly there is a reason that everyone who stayed stayed um so i think we did end up with our with our healthiest 
collective. Yeah. <laughs> what about um, what what's the di- what what's the difference between touring or earlier years versus touring now? Um, it's really the shows. Like the the biggest difference is the shows, the music. I think everything behind the music, the way we make music together, you know. In, in, in the sense of the genre and all that stuff, it's changed massively and the sound has changed massively. But yeah, like the way we make music is, is kind of exactly the same actually. Um, but I would say, yeah, the music is the main difference. Easily, easily the main difference. You talk about you, the way you make music is the same. How do you guys approach songwriting? Um, it's um, it's pretty fluid. Um, I would say we don't have like a set way, and in a sense, like there is a bit of an open door thing going on there too. Because if you look at the credits of like our records, you know, not everyone plays on every song, not everyone plays on every record. Even people kind of come in, come in and out. We've only a handful of times made records in the traditional sense of like you go to a um, a studio and you like make a record in one go. We've actually only done that like a couple of times. Um, I've always found that ma- way of making music really, really challenging. We're more likely to just set up in someone's like kitchen or lounge room and just leave it there for like a couple of months and just work on it as we go. And over the last like five years or so, we've had, we're on our second studio now, but just like a, a studio in Melbourne that's like a kind of home base where we just kind of go and work. And the, the current space we have is, is one giant room where we can like make really loud music and no one will get pissed off basically. <laughs> um, and then a couple of other smaller rooms that are like, I guess like just miniature little control rooms where we can just go and like mix or edit or do overdubs or whatever. And sometimes like all six, six of us are there and sometimes there's, a bunch of other people there, other people we work with or people from like labels or like, you know, pressing plants or like whatever that we're hanging with or artists. Jace who makes all of our art is often there as well. Uh, and then sometimes there's one or two of us there just kind of like, you know, making music in more of a solitary way. Um, but it is very much a, when we make a record, it's like you can contribute as little or as much as you would like. Um and I guess like my role has always been to sort of um, it's like the producer in like the old fashioned sense of the word. Like I'm just, I'm just kind of keeping everyone organized and, and trying to curate the best ideas and sometimes make hard calls if things don't work. If people put a lot of time into a certain idea and it's not going to work, you know, that's always a tough call. Um, but it's, yeah, it's always kind of been my role to like, I guess, oversee all of that also be peer mediator keep everyone happy and still like creatively stimulated try not to make people do more than they want to but try to keep people interested enough that they want to keep kind of like creating and keep being involved so that's my very loose and vague and like probably not really answer to your question answer to your question how do you so, like, as you know, if you put on your producer hat, how do you know when, you know, it's like you say it normally takes two years, but it seems you're really meticulous about the finishing of a project. How do you know when a song's done or a record's done for you? Mm. Um, it's really, it's really, really hard because you, you can always work on something forever. Um, and I, I do always try to remind myself that things don't need to be perfect and when we're making a record, there are certain artists that I like to listen to a lot. Or when I'm finishing records specifically, there are certain artists that I like to listen to a lot because their records aren't perfect and that's why I love them. And it really helps like center me and remind myself that I'm not trying to make like a piece of glass that you can see right through and you don't even know that there's any imperfections in there. It's like the imperfections are what are what make the the piece have character. For example, like my favorite person for this, and this is something that someone that a lot of people don't think about is Bob Dylan. I like his records never, ever sounded perfect. Um, 
but they always just had so so much character. Um, so yeah, I do try to listen to music like that a lot when we're finishing something, just so I I know it's okay if it's not perfect. Like it's just about the vibe. How many records did it take until you <laughs> took that philosophy into place? I had that from the first one with Gizzard because I think it went to the idea of being in other bands that were trying to make their records perfect. Um, and it was the philosophy from the very beginning, actually. So that's one thing that stuck around through every record that we've made. Do you think, uh, do you do you take that same philosophy as being a father? Um. <laughs> Maybe without realizing it a little. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Any records, you know, any records in the past that you lose sleep over because you felt like they weren't finished and you forced to release? No. Um, we've never, like, been forced to release anything, really. We've always been very careful about, like, the people that we work with or record labels or distributors or whoever. Um We've never been in a situation where we've felt pressured to do anything and or anything or do anything weird or nothing that we haven't wanted, um, which is really lucky and great. So, yeah, there are records which, like, if I made today, I would make them different, definitely. But when I have had to listen back to our music that was made, I always listen to it and I'm like, well, what the fuck is that for? That's that's weird. You know, why did I do that? That's strange. But then I'm like, I guess that's. I have no idea why I made that decision. Why does that guitar sound like it's coming out of a like fucking deodorant can? You know, like, but, but sometimes, but then I think, okay, well, yeah, that's cool. Like, I don't know why I did that, but why not? It's, it's awesome to think, you know, just to forget it. Cause like, you know, I talked to a lot of musicians about this. It's not about the records, they're not about us, it's for them. So if we overthink them, fuck it. Well, what's the point, you know? Totally, and it, it is the most liberating experience as well to finish a record and then to put it out and to finish it and to, for it to belong to other people. And for it to just, that's the moment to me where it feels done because you can't change it. Everyone's already heard it. It's just like the biggest fulfilling sigh of relief. Right. You know, it's the best. Is there any records that you like try to play live and they're just, they don't hit as hard as the as you you vision them as a record. Um, there are heaps actually. Um, more like song to song, really. Um, I think over the years, like we've learned to just if that happens and it does happen, to not worry too much and just let it be different, and then find a new version of that song to exist live. Um, but yeah, like Butterfly 3000, for example, which was made out of like modular synthesizer loops, really. Um, and then recorded piecemeal in Melbourne lockdown with everyone in different houses. Um, trying to translate that live is really hard. And just not really in the DNA of like what our band is about just a free flowing kind of band. We've never used, we've never even used a click track, you know, whereas for all <laughs> oh, yeah. these songs, like we have to use like a, we have to use like a mod, like a, like a synthesizer clock and stuff. And it's just like, fuck this. <laughs> it's just too <laughs> hard. Um, so we, we actually have put like a lot of hours into translating that stuff live and, We've been playing one song from time to time, not super often. I like to play more. It's just, we actually just have a lot of other songs that, like, I want to kind of bring in too. So, yeah, yeah, maybe one day we'll get there and we'll play all those songs. That's what I was thinking, you know, with 20 (laughs) records, you know, how do you decide what songs to play each night? Is it your decision or do you kind of not try to have the same set list or do you not care about that shit? Hmm. Um. No, we've been doing like a different set list every night for the past few years. Um, I think we've done like 80 something songs on this tour so far, which is, which is cool. It's like kind of what I've always wanted it to be. It's like each, you know, each show is, is very different. Um, 
yeah, that's uh, we've been sort of like working towards this being the thing for a while, and I feel like we're starting to kind of like nail that as like a concept to in each show feeling unique. Sometimes we write the set lists a week or a few days in advance if there's certain songs there that people need to like run over, spend right. some time like spend some time with. Then maybe songs that we haven't played for five years or something, or maybe songs we've never played or whatever. But oftentimes they're kind of written day of, and it will be based on like what the venue's like or maybe what we played the last few nights. I try not to repeat many songs at all from like the last time we played that particular city. And if we play multiple nights in a, in a certain city, we'll try and repeat no songs at all. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of a fun vibe. So it doesn't really matter about what record, what songs you put out in that year, because if they're going to come to a, to one of your shows, it, you, you might not even play anything off that new record. Yeah, totally. Bonner is going to be a blast, dude. You know, you, have you guys ever played Bonner before? Have you guys ever played Bonnaroo before? We have. I want to say it was like, I want to. I want to say it was like 2015 or 16. Um, I can't remember which year, but we we have played before. It's cool. It's 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 a rad festival. Yeah. But um, yeah. I guess that was a, a fairly long time ago now, so it's probably changed a bit. It's probably still great. I'm sure. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and you got a bigger stage. The boy, you guys are blowing up. I fucking love to see it, bud. So keep rocking. Um, you know, you've done, you put out 20 records. I'm assuming you're gonna put about 20 or 40 of them, more of them. You know, when it's all said and done, and you go on and move on with your life, what do you want this band to be remembered by? Um. Yeah, man. That's like a, that's like a heavy question. Hey. Um, like firstly it's kind of I will I will put like a little asterisk on it and will say that I don't think it is a driving motivation for us about like what other people kind of are going to be remembering us for or what our legacy is or whatever I don't think we're like thinking about this in some sort of Spartan way about like legacy or anything I really do think we're just in it for the kind of friendship and the camaraderie and the and the adventure um but like yeah i'd i'd like people to think that we we were somewhat fearless maybe and we just kind of we yeah we kind of just did take risks and um mess with the kind of like accepted norms of what being a musician was supposed to be um, I'd be pretty pumped if, if people thought that about us. But aside from that, like I'm, I'm honestly just happy to be here. <laughs> like I just feel like really stoked to be here and like be doing what we're doing still, like after ten or plus years of doing it. And that's what? the truth. Well, I'm gonna clap to that. Let's fucking go. Let's go. Way to go, Stu. Keep rocking, dog. Fuck shit up out there. Uh, yeah. Go out there, enjoy Mexico, <laughs> enjoy your tour, um, enjoy fatherhood, and um, I'll catch you at Bonnaroo, buddy. Thanks, y'all. See you at Bonnaroo. See you, Can't buddy. Wait. Yeah, later. How's it going? Peace. Bye. Later. There it is. Let's do. Yeah. Awesome. That was fun. I need relationship advice. I'll, I'm glad to give that. I have a great relationship. That's the one thing I do know how to do is keep a woman quiet. <laughs> <laughs> You're insane. <laughs> yeah, I am. Should that, I read this text? Um, not her text. My text. How I approached it. Do you want this? Do you want this on the podcast? Um, I'm I'm asking for advice, and this. Okay, is, I, I we can cut it out. I just don't know what the text says yet, so I don't know okay. how revealing it is. You know what I mean? Um, I was just telling her how busy I am and how how yeah. I'm at campgrounds where there's no people service. hate to hear about how busy you are. By I the know. way, okay. okay. Just so you know. <laughs> I told her, I also told her I'm an empath and I okay. can't That's number live. Number two mistake. Don't ever call yourself a <laughs> fucking empath. The only people on earth that call themselves empaths are narcissists. Next thing. Oh, fuck. Well. You asked. I know. I did ask. Don't ever call yourself an empath. That's so douchebag. It's Really? I hate when people. Oh, uh, I have a joke with it from my, with my high school friends. Whenever I mess with them, I'll go, as an empath, I agree. <laughs> if you call yourself an empath, you're weird. It's normal to have empathy, guys. Okay. You're supposed to have empathy. You're supposed to feel things. You're not an empath. You're a person. You're supposed to feel things. Yeah, you're a human being. Good job. Way to go. Well, I don't even want to read this one. <laughs>
No, I'm on your side. No, you're not. I'm just saying, don't say. I'm just giving you advice. Okay. I'm saying, so don't call yourself an empath. And well, don't I, that's it. was my main thing. I said, I feel. I I can't. Uh, I feel is a much better. Uh, I'm an smart. empath, and I and I feel everything when it hurts you. Oh. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't think a relationship should feel like that. Let's okay. pump the brake. <laughs> chill, 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 chill. All right, I need to go to bed. Pussy. Mm-hmm. As an empath, I can see that you're tired. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fuck you, Nick. This is as an empath thing is never going to die. It's here forever. Get used to it as an empath. Um, we got shows coming up. Um, we're playing in Atlanta. This weekend, Friday, with Grace Potter. Ooh, she's Anna, a badass. She played Rooster My friend's Walk playing too. drummer drums for her right now. This girl from my hometown. Oh, Fort, she's dope. The blonde hair? Yeah. Um, she's from my hometown, Fort Wayne. Oh, Wayne's. sick. Fort tell, Wayne. her, tell her she killed it. She's awesome. Does she sing too in that band? She sings. Yeah, yeah, yeah she yeah. sings. She's from Fort Wayne. Mm-hmm. Makes, so if you're in Atlanta, I know we have a lot of podcast fans in Atlanta. Come see me at uh, Candler Park for Music Festival. Friday, we're in Lafayette, Louisiana. God, Mince, this is another. Is fucking, Mincy going to go to that one? That's right, the heart of Mincy country. He he's in New York City. Oh yeah, he's a Mincy. Mincy got. I saw that video. Viral. I saw that. I'm proud of Mincy. You know what? That's one of the rare times in my life. I actually commented on his shit. That's one of the rare times in my life I've seen someone go viral for yelling at someone, and I'm on the side of the person yelling. <laughs> the <laughs> oh stupid really? Whistler, yeah. So we're at um, shout out Mincy. Shout out to Mincy. We're in Lafayette, Louisiana. Hell yeah! Opening for the Cold War Kids on Saturday, this Saturday, and then Sunday, we are in um, Saint Augustine for Fool's Paradise. Oh, that'll be looks awesome. I'm yeah. freeze lettuce. Yeah, and we got Corey Henry on the show next week. Carrie Henry. Carrie Henry. Carrie Henry. It's gonna be exciting. That's awesome. Yeah, we got. I love that guy. Game. He's a genius. Yeah, the these open- are. These are the reverse dates. So now we're playing at three o'clock, every three or four o'clock. Oh, that's better. No, because you have those six o'clock flights. Oh, I get it. And then you go right to the gig. Go right to the gig. So it's six a.m. Either way. I hate six o'clock flights. It's the worst because you know. I've damn yeah, done it. We a lot. roll in. The band rolls in like a fucking like, mm-hmm. like a herd of zombies, and we go to the bar. Mm-hmm. We keep drinking. That's your first mistake. Well, we have all day to hopefully recoup, go to bed. Hopefully. Because the show's end at four. You can't just like fall asleep. I get it. Bed. I'm not like knocking you here. I've done it. You're not making. Oh, God. Let's I got this. a loogie. Can we? I'm drinking that. Can I spin in it? Oh, I'm not, yeah, go ahead. I just won't drink any more of it. What if I still drink it? Like, oh, man. All right. I got to get out of here. Jesus Christ. I'm going to bed. <laughs> I'm not healthy right now. Um. <laughs> you want to give him your nose, your septum is like you're going <laughs> every time you breathe in. I'm sorry for my disgusting. Uh, I didn't even. I didn't do cocaine or nothing. It's just you don't do cocaine. You just have probably have a deviated. No, it's the allergies going from fucking one farm town to a next. Farm at the town to the next, you L.A. pieces of shit are so <laughs> fucking. I'm sorry, people are out there making the food you eat so you can have your goddamn poke bowls and your sushi burritos before you go surfing. <laughs> At 3 p.m. on a goddamn weekday. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> God. Right, we got to go. Here's your motivation. Don't get in a fucking car. Wear your seatbelt and your lift, idiots. It's yeah. the real world. You're still in a car. You're still alive. There's, it's, not, it's just a human being driving the car. It's not some special. There's no force field around it, okay? Just because you paid $11 doesn't mean they're guaranteeing your safety for the rest of your <laughs> life. Okay? There's your motivation. Enjoy King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. Stu was great. And... Um, Stu, that's my middle name, remember? Yeah, and um, sign up for Ripsy.com and buy some dialed in gummies. Yeah, eat them gummies Colorado. up. I'm sorry the promotions weren't as good this week. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, they don't have any rosin, <laughs> or they're rosin, there's no solvents, uh, QR code on them. Just, okay. just buy them and eat them. All right, I'm going to bed. Bye. <laughs>